Would you pray with me? We have done it, and now we do it one more time here before I speak. We wait for you. We wait for you. And I pray that you would come now in our waiting and in my speaking and satisfy our souls in Christ and all that he has done and all that you, Father, are for us in him. And I pray that under you, Father, we would see that there isn't anything greater except for one thing. There isn't anything greater under you except for one thing than the individual soul aflame in worship. And that one thing is the bride of Christ aflame in worship. So come and show us now the connection between these two things, I pray. And set our hearts and our churches aflame with God-centered, Christ-exalting, Bible-saturated worship. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So the individual human soul, underline the word individual, the individual human soul rightly seeing the glory of Christ and rightly savoring the glory of Christ is at the heart of the purpose for which God made the world. And until we grasp the relationship between that and corporate worship, we won't be able to give an account for why the worship of the bride, the worship of the temple, the worship of the body is the ultimate end for why God made the world, not merely the individual soul worshiping. So what I want to do in this message is try to steer a course between two errors. On the one side is the error of thinking that the relationship between the individual worshiping human soul and God, that relationship between my soul and God in worship is the ultimate purpose for which God made the world. It's not. The other error that I would like to avoid is being so captivated by the corporate reality of the worshiping people of God, the body of Christ, the temple of God, the bride of Christ, that we lose sight of the fact that the vital, ongoing, eternal intensity of the individual soul is absolutely essential for the authenticity of that corporate reality of worship, which is the ultimate goal for which God made the world. So the New Testament forbids that we neglect or forget or minimize the radical, essential, eternal significance of the individual worshiping soul. It forbids, don't ever forget that, don't ever minimize that, don't ever neglect that, don't ever think that there can be a God-centered worship without that. And the New Testament forbids that we forget or neglect or minimize the coming into being through Christ of a blazingly beautiful bride who is more than the sum of her parts. So that's where we're going. Let's begin by focusing on the relationship between the individual soul and the ultimate purpose of God. I don't want to downplay or minimize either of these. We start with the individual. We'll end with the corporate. One of the clearest statements in God's word about the end for which God made everything is Isaiah 43, 6 and 7. I'll read it to you. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is 
called by my name, whom I created for my glory. Every son, every daughter created to display the glory of God. Or Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. He works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we might be to the praise of his glory. Or Romans eleven thirty six. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So God created the world. He sustains the world. He governs the world. He does everything in the world to display his glory. That is his greatness, his beauty, his worth. Those are my three efforts to get at the meaning of the word glory. Oh, how often we will use the word glory in this conference. You'll hear it, no doubt, hundreds of times. So I'm filling it up with three other words for you. You can meditate on whether greatness, beauty, worth helps you grasp what you're saying when you say that word glory. He does everything he does in order to display his glory. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Psalm 19.1. The trees of the forest sing for joy. Psalm 96.12. The rivers clap their hands and the hills sing for joy together. Psalm 98.8. The meadows and the valleys shout and sing for joy. Psalm 65, verse 13, or Isaiah 44. Sing, O heavens, shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it, for the Lord will be glorified in Israel. So you got the heavens the mountains and the hills, the forest and the trees, the rivers and the meadows, all of them created to sing. To sing or clap to the glory of their maker. And they do. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, that's what they are doing. May the Lord give you eyes and give you ears if you haven't heard it or seen it. So does a 150 voice choir of unbelieving musicians singing the Hallelujah Chorus. You can find that on almost any large city venue every Easter. Unbelievers singing Handel's Messiah. Surrounded by an orchestra full of unbelieving musicians. And they too are like trees and meadows glorifying God with their God-given amazing creativity and skill. Like trees, soulless trees clapping their hands. So if God gets so much glory from the, the external echoes of his creative and redeeming excellency in this world like that, external evidences of his reality, if he gets so much glory that way, why is there a need for the individual human soul to have any particular affections for God in order to him, for him to achieve his creator purpose. Isn't it enough that God's purpose is being glorified by the trees and the planets and the skies and the hills and the rivers and the orchestras and the choirs all singing because they were made in the image of God, whether they believe or not. Isn't that enough? And of course the answer is no. No, it's not enough. Why? 
because God does not intend to be half glorified. Picture a king, a king and a kingdom, two kinds of kings. A king may be glorified, magnified, praised, honored for his great achievements, power, wisdom. He rules his kingdom with an iron hand. He sees to it, great fortifications have been built in my kingdom. Beautiful buildings have been built in my kingdom. Gardens have been constructed in my kingdom. My citizens under my iron hand have been forced to become phenomenal, excellent musicians playing grand and excellent music in my kingdom. The finest pieces of art I force to be made in my kingdom. He's not so great a king and he's not so glorified as the king who is loved by his people, admired, revered, cherished, treasured, desired, enjoyed by his people so that the affections of their King exalting hearts create greater fortifications and more beautiful buildings and greater gardens and greater musical compositions. A king is more glorified by a cherishing people than a cowering people. He's not going to be settling for half glorification. He will have all the glory from the heart and the skill. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, this is one of the most important statements on worship in the Bible. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, this people honors me with their lips But their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. Vain. Zero. In vain do they worship me. Matthew 15, 7. So, here you have in this text an excellent use of the mouth. That's what lips are for. With your lips... You honor me. That's what they're for, and they're doing it. Half. My honor is sounding forth. My glory is sounding forth from your lips. I'm being glorified by your mouth, just like by the mountains and the trees and the rivers and the unbelieving orchestras and ensembles and choirs on Easter. Their heart, he says, is far away. A heart only exists in one place, in an individual. Individual hearts are far away, meaning what? Verse 9, Matthew 15, 9, meaning, in vain do they worship me. In vain. Meaning, it's an external echo of excellence and a zero in the heart. It's not worship. It's not the essence. It misses the essence. The the essence of worship is the heart aflame with affection for the beauties of God. What comes out of the mouth is fruit to that root. When that root is severed and those affections are gone, this God counts as zero. In vain do they worship me. That's not why he created the world. Not to be half glorified, externally glorified. Trees clapping their hands, unbelieving orchestras reflecting his excellence. That's not why he created the world. 
He created the world in order that there might be an echo of his excellence in the hearts of his affectionate people. That affection is the echo of his excellence that completes the reason for creation at the individual level. Where that's not present, Amos 5.23, the voice of God sounds over every congregation. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen, says the Lord. Why? The heart is not there. Don't hire unbelievers in your church. It almost goes without saying, but is so crucial, I will say it anyway, that these absolutely essential affections are in individual hearts and nowhere else. That's where affection, love, treasuring, desiring, delighting, that's where they exist, here, nowhere else. Everything else is expression or awakening causes. But here's where it resides. Just think of it. The universe made for this, these affections, these loves. It's the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your, tell me. That's the first one. Yes, the others are mentioned. Number one starts here. If not there, the others don't count. He turns away from them. Now, let's switch gears. Let's turn to the question of the corporate reality. If affections for God in the individual human soul are the essence, and I think they are, the essence of the self-glorifying purpose of God in the universe, Now mark the word essence, because I'm not saying totality. I'm not saying the individual human heart affections are the totality of worship or the totality of God's ultimate purpose. They are the essence, without which nothing counts. Okay, so keep that word in mind. If affections for God in the individual soul are the essence of the self-glorifying purpose of God in creating the world, how do those heart affections give rise to the corporate reality of the worshiping church? Because it's clear from the New Testament, It's not just millions and millions of isolated, independent human souls with white-hot affection for God that he's aiming at like a billion solos. That's not the picture of the end of history. God is bringing into being a diverse, global church pictured as the body the temple, the bride of Christ. Paul pictures the church as the wife of Jesus in Ephesians 5.27, and this is what he says about the purpose of Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the creator of the universe, coming into the world. Why did he come? Why did he come and die? And here's what it says in Ephesians 5, 27. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor. (laughs) He wants a beautiful wife for his son, for himself. In splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So Christ means to have a beautiful wife. It's an amazing statement. A wife made up of 
millions of white hot worshiping individuals, but vastly more. That's what this talk is about. The more. Why more? How more? This conference is devoted to blessing churches. At least that's my understanding of what's going on here. <laughs> blessing, congregational, singing, especially. There's more, but mainly I'm hoping that's what happens. Hundreds and hundreds of congregations do what they're called to do better because of what happens here. So, this local expression of the local church, what is it? Emerging, global, everlasting, corporate, worshiping reality called the bride of Christ. What local churches do in their gathered worshiping assemblies is to, you can say it different ways, rehearse for that eternal vocation of the bride, foretaste of that eternal vocation of the bride. That's what we do week after week in our gatherings called corporate worship. Now there's a text. My guess is for many of you who think worship thoughts all the time, this text is very prominent in your mind and I just wanna make sure you see what I see. You probably see more, but let me show you three absolutely crucial things that I see as I read this to you. This is Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, 18 to 19. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Can I do that? With your heart. Three things, from your heart, or it's not worship. To the Lord, always addressing one another, always. That's corporate worship. Now, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether the song is vertically directed, like we come, O Christ, to thee, the second person singular vertical or horizontal come Christians join us and sing right that's you you plural second person plural it doesn't matter whether the song happens to be grammatically addressed to God or grammatically addressed to people this text says and it's true Every song is sung in the presence of God. And he's listening to every song and he's either holding his nose or loving it. <laughs> he's enjoying, as he will forever, the reception of our praises into his life. Whether we're singing to each other or whether we're singing to him. 